If you're new to Vox, my name is Justin. I'm the lead pastor. Thanks for being with us today. We are honored to have you and excited to gather. So excited about next week. I know you've been hearing about it a lot, but if you are not yet signed up for a community group or if you're considering hosting a community group, we start a teaching series called The Sacred Us next Sunday looking at this idea of community. What does it really mean to be a part of the community of Jesus. And so I'm so excited to dive into this content with you. And if you haven't signed up, make sure you do today. There's also Sacred Us books out in the lobby. You can get your hands on one of those and uh, join us. Join us in this journey together as we grow in our faith and in our understanding of what it means to be a part of the family of God. Luke chapter 15 is where we'll be today. As I was praying these last couple of weeks about this Sunday, Luke 15 was really on my heart, a familiar story, one you may have heard before, but I think God has something special for you today. And my, real, my prayer has been that, that the spirit of Jesus right now, right here, would take a story that maybe you're a little familiar with and he would open it up to you so that it becomes the word that he wants to speak to your heart right now. Luke 15, starting in verse 11. And he, that's Jesus, said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, give me the share of the property that's coming to me. He divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. There he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, began to be in need. And he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, ran and embraced him and kissed him. And he said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring, him, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, what are these, uh, what this meant? He said to him, your brother has come. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. And he was angry. He refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I want to speak today under the heading, understanding your misunderstanding. Understanding your misunderstanding. I want to expose this morning an, a misunderstanding that very often distorts and distracts us from real relationship with God. And my prayer is that the more we understand it, the more we will be changed. So let's just open our hearts, invite the Spirit of God to work in us today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we each come to you in our own position, Lord. Some of us in the middle of a trial, some of us in the middle of a celebration, some of us going through a hard time, and some of us experiencing a wonderful blessing in these last number of weeks and months. God, we all come with different circumstances, different situations. And so we come today just as a people who want to see you, and know you, and experience the light of your truth in our lives. And so I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the house. I pray that you would be glorified, and God, that, uh, that Lord, you would take these words today, and that you would draw each of us to a place where we experience and encounter Christ in a fresh way. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. 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 You know, relationships take work. 
Relationships, I don't know if you knew that. Relationships take work. If you're sitting next to a family member, a spouse, a friend, you can go ahead and look at them. Just tell them. Relationships take work. Go ahead and tell them. They do. They take work, don't they? There are times where you're going to misunderstand each other. Times where communication is going to break down. Times where you make false assumptions about one another. Times where the other person offends you, where it's challenging. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a very close relationship like your, like your spouse or your best friend or if it's a relationship from the outside that you just interact with. Relationships always seem to take more than we think they're going to take. I read a story this past week about the Spanish explorers when they landed in South America in the 1500s. They reached the southern part of uh, what would later be called Mexico and they went south from there and they were exploring the area and they met the people of that land and they asked those people, what do you call this place? And of course, those people didn't speak Spanish, right? And so they didn't know what to say, but they kept telling the explorers in their native language, we don't know what you're saying. We don't know what you're saying. We don't know what you're saying, which in their language came out as Yucatan, Yucatan, Yucatan. And so the Spanish explorers said, oh, they call this place Yucatan. Okay, cool. Um, Let's call it the Yucatan Peninsula. And here we are all these years later. I think something was lost in translation, right? It's like, I don't think we were supposed to name it. We don't understand what you're saying. I don't think that was the... The goal, but misunderstanding is just a part of life. And oftentimes, you know, we say things we don't mean or we say things we wish he hadn't said and there's offense or there's challenge or there's a need for forgiveness or whatever it might be. Uh, just this past week, Chrissy, my wife, was with our three-year-old and they were hanging out and just in the middle of their time together, Thea, our three-year-old, she goes, holy crap! And Thea's like, or Chrissy's like, huh, no, honey, we don't say that. Honey, no, 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 we don't say those words. Those are not appropriate words to say. And Thea looked back at my wife and said, only you say that? (laughs) Which is like, oh, (laughs) I can tell that story because Chrissy's holier than I am. So um, we can we can say it. But but it's like, oh, boy, misunderstanding, you know. And so we approach a story here today that many of us have heard. And you know it by a particular name, right? This is the story of the anybody know? The prodigal son, yeah, we know it as the story of the prodigal son, but I want to highlight today that Jesus never gives it that name, that that's a name that it picked up through history, and you might know the term prodigal or the prodigal son or whatever it might be, but that's not actually the context of the story. That's a part of the story, but to see it through the lens of the story of the prodigal son is to actually miss the heartbeat and the larger message behind this story, because we're told in the beginning that there was a man and he had two sons, so the story is not about one of the sons alone. It's actually about the man who is the father in the story, and the story tells us of two specific sons. And this story actually is intended to reveal to us the nature of God. It's intended to show us God's heart, that he's not exactly who we think he is, and it's intended to expose in us a very dangerous misunderstanding, that if you misunderstand God, it is the greatest problem in your life. That every one of us doesn't quite see him as he is because God's not quite what you expect him to be. And so our minds must be renewed. Our hearts must be reawakened. And maybe you're here and you've been following Christ for 30 years or maybe you've been following him for 30 days. Whatever your circumstance might be, your heart needs a fresh experience with who God really is. Amen. Yeah. And so that's my prayer today, that before we leave, that the Spirit of God would reveal the heart of God in a fresh way in your life, and that you and I would each experience an awakening of an awareness of who God truly is. So what does it mean to follow God? What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, I think a lot of us, when we think of Christianity, the assumption of our culture in this day is that Christianity is kind of a set of traditions or a set of rules that, you know, you're supposed to do these good things. You know, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. These are the Christian things to do. And, and, and if you do all these things, then, you know, God will accept you. And so be a good person. And if you're a good person, you know, you'll receive the blessing of God. And you could call this moralism. Moralism tells us that through our performance, right, through the things that we do, we find acceptance before God. And the opposite of moralism, you could call secularism. Secularism just basically says that it's not through the obedience to some moral code given to you by a divine being, but rather through your own journey of experience and discovery, you find a version of what's good for you. And in that, you discover fulfillment. But these ideas of moralism or secularism, they're not new ideas. In fact, they've been around since the very beginning, that when Jesus was crucified on a cross, he had on his left a thief and on his right a thief. And so just as Christ was crucified between two thieves on his right and on his left, so the truth of who God is always stands between two lies, always stands between two distortions, two thieves. 
And until you begin to see these thieves in your own heart and in your own perspective, you'll never see God as he truly is, as he truly is. And so it requires a radical renewal of our minds. And so the younger son, we could say he represents the first thief, okay? He represents the first thief, and he goes to the father, and he says, give me my inheritance and uh, what's due me, right? Now, you have to understand a little bit of the context of this day. Similar to our time, if a family member dies, you might receive an inheritance, but you're not going to get the inheritance while they're alive, right? It comes upon their death, and so to ask for his inheritance before his father died was completely unheard of. It was something that no son would do. In fact, historians tell us it's the equivalent of the son walking up to the father and saying, hey, I can't wait until you die. And so rather than wait until you die, I'd like to cash out now. I don't want relationship with you. I don't want interaction with you. I just want your things. And so give me my inheritance today. Now that sounds incredibly offensive. And even in those times, for someone to do that would be unheard of. And the response would appropriately probably be disowning that son. Okay, That's what we would expect the father to do. But it's interesting because I think it gives us a glimpse into the way that we often treat God without realizing it. That oftentimes in our lives, we would not say it out loud, but we would say with our actions, hey, I want your peace. I want a good marriage. I want a nice career. I want health for my body. I want blessing on my plans. I want all kinds of things that come from God, but I don't really want relationship with God. I don't really want submission to God. I don't really want God in all of my stuff. Now, the father in this story, who represents God for us, does something unexpected. He actually sells the property that belongs to his son upon his death, and he gives him his inheritance early, and the son leaves. And he goes out on his own to find fulfillment apart from the father through self-discovery. What's self-discovery? I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to figure out on my own what makes me happy, and I'm going to discover myself and discover what I believe. And oftentimes... I think that we approach God this way, where we say, hey, I believe in your love, and I really like what you say in the Bible about peace and joy, but when you talk about money, I I don't really like that. I don't really like what you have to say. I mean, what you say about sexuality, come on, it's so archaic. Are you kidding me? Or what you say about this or what you say about that. I don't like what you say about caring for the poor so much. I mean, and and I'm sure conceptually that's fine, but functionally, I don't want to rearrange my whole life for that, And, and, and I like this, and I don't like that, and so we treat God a little bit like a cafeteria where we take certain things, and then we leave certain things. We go, that's how I think of God, and then we build this idea of God that sort of fits our life best. And the underlying assumption in doing that is I know what's best for me. And I know what I feel. And what I feel is what is real. And so I should follow those desires. Self-discovery. Now, we're told in the story that the son does this until he runs out of money. And then a severe famine hits the land. And I want to suggest to you today that for every single person who pursues self-discovery, you will eventually come to a place of famine. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to run out of food necessarily, but it means that you're going to run out of life, that there's going to be something that leaves you empty and in need. And so you say a severe famine. What does that mean? Well, things were going good, so you got that DUI. And then things started to fall apart. Things were going good until she said, I don't love you anymore. And then things started falling apart. Things were going good until that relationship started to buckle under the pressure. Things were going good until you got that cancer diagnosis. Things were going good until you lost that family member. Things were going good until things started spiraling out of control with your job. And and, and then all of a sudden you found yourself in famine. All of a sudden you found yourself off balance, off kilter. You were no longer in control. And here's what happens to this young man in verse 15. Look, it says, so he went, check this out, and hired himself out. Look at that little phrase. He hired himself out. I was fascinated by that phrase. So one of the citizens of the country sent him in the field to feed pigs, right? He hired himself out. The literal Greek says he attached himself. It was a word used to describe the dust that sticks to your feet when you're walking through a dusty area. It attaches itself to you. He attached himself. In other words, he began to develop attachments, right? He hired himself out. I wonder if there's anybody here today who's hired themselves out without realizing it. You've developed attachments. You know, at first it was just so you could get through the night, took that little sleeping pill, everything was fine. But then after a little while, that sleeping pill just became a necessity, right? And then before you knew it, it became an attachment. 
And then it was that back pain from that car accident. It was just an issue, and they prescribed you those drugs, and it was fine. But then you ran out, and you needed them, and you realized that the withdrawals were too difficult to deal with. And so you just got it refilled. And boy, it was so easy. It was so simple just to get it refilled, and then you got it refilled again. And, and now it's been a while, and it's now an attachment. It's an attachment because you need that drink before you can go to sleep. It's an attachment because you can't function without that thing. See, that relationship might have started healthy, but pretty soon it wandered into codependence and it became for you an attachment. You don't know who you are without her. You don't know who you are without him. It became an attachment. At first, you were excited about your career. Things were going to take off. Things were going to grow. It was awesome. But pretty soon, you were no longer leading your career. Your career was leading you and you had to work and you had to be there. And it became more important than the people who were supposed to be most important because you developed an attachment, so there's a progression. Do you see it? It begins with self-discovery, experimentation, and then it leads to famine. And from that famine, you begin to cultivate attachments. And then verse 16 tells us, but no one gave him anything. So the progression takes full course here. Experimentation to famine, famine to adjust, uh, attachments, attachments into emptiness. And so maybe right now, I'm explaining your heart. God's speaking to you that there's an emptiness that defines your spiritual life. An emptiness that defines your relationship with God. But something happens to this young man that's unexpected, right? Something happens that there's really no explanation for in the text. It just happens. And that's my prayer for anyone here today who's been pursuing self-discovery and finds themselves far from God. That maybe it's been a year. Maybe it's been 10 years. Maybe it's been your whole life. But you find yourself out of step with God. You find yourself cold towards him. You find yourself pursuing your own deal. And if that's you today then I, my prayer is that what God did for this young man, he would do for you. It says he came to himself. Come on, somebody. It says he came to himself. But when he came to himself, well, how did that happen? Just a sovereign work of God. That's how it happened. He came to himself. All of a sudden, one day he woke up, he said, what am I doing? One day he woke up, he said, why am I doing this? I don't have to be isolated. I don't have to be lonely. I don't have to be empty. I don't have to be alone. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be worried. I don't have to be depressed. I don't have to be addicted. I don't have to live with this bondage in my life. Who says I got to be a slave for the rest of my days? He came to himself. And my prayer is that even right now, you would realize that there is a father who loves you and you don't need to live separated from him. If you would, by the spirit of God, even now come to yourself you'd realize that he's calling you home. He's calling you home. And in this moment, he goes running back and the father sees him from a distance and comes running towards him. And he gives him what he least expected, which is immediate acceptance. He says, oh no, I'm gonna be your servant. I'm gonna be your slave. I'll work it off. I'll do all the things. And the father says, are you kidding? Are you kidding? Put a robe on him, put a ring on him. If this doesn't mildly offend you, then you haven't seen the heart of God. Because his grace is offensive. His grace is uncomfortable. He loves you too much, it seems. And he lavishes this love on the son and accepts him into his family. Friend, this is a revelation of the heart of God for every single person who has ever wandered away. And so if you're here today and you're asking yourself, well, how would God respond if I opened my life? How would God respond if I gave him control? How would God, you know, he'd probably look at me like this. It's about time, man. <laughs> or he'd be like, well, why don't you give a little money? We'll see if it's legit, right? Or mm, serve in the church for five years, and then I'll accept you back. That's not what he does. All of those inclinations in your heart are a lie. Jesus shared this story so that we could see God as he truly is. So this is the story of the prodigal son. And for many of us, we've heard that story. We say it's incredible. It is incredible. But to end there is actually to miss the point of the story because, again, it's about a man who had two sons. And we only looked at one of them. And we looked more at the son than we did at the man. And, and so we've missed some things because Jesus was crucified between two thieves, right? So if the younger son represents the first thief, the first thing that will rob us of relationship with God, this lie of self-discovery, I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it, how I want to do it, and how that ultimately leads to emptiness. There's this older brother, and I feel like his journey is often overlooked and potentially more deadly because he serves in the story as the second thief, a picture of the second way we are robbed of relationship with God. See, when he hears about his younger brother's return, he's upset, and he won't come inside. 
And the father goes out to him, and this is what he says. Look in verse 29. He answered the father, look, these many years I've served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat. Which is interesting because it's like the Lord knows your prayer, right? I know you're here. You've been asking for a young goat. And um, just same deal. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. And I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, he devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed a fattened calf for him. I mean, even though there's a cultural disconnect, we get the idea, right? What is he saying? This isn't fair. Dad, this isn't fair. I mean, he's a bad person. I'm a good person. Bad things should happen to bad people. Good things should happen to good people. This isn't fair. You're not doing it right. I should get the fattened calf. I should get the really nice robe. I should get these things because I've been good all these years, right? So the older son represents all the good people. I know there's some good people in the room. I know you're here, you know. You pay your taxes on time. You come to a full stop at every stop sign, right? <laughs> You don't have like this stoptional mentality. You can roll through. No, 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 not me. I completely stop, right? Like that's your, you're good. You're a good person. You coach basketball teams. You volunteer for the homeless. You help all these different people. You're really good. I mean, you're a really good person. Jesus wants us to see that just as the younger son was lost in his badness, somehow the older son got lost in his goodness. That you can get lost in your goodness. And it's far more deceptive, especially in our time. I love, uh, Tim Keller calls this moral conformity. It's a good name for it. Moral conformity is the second thief. Robs our relationship with God. Tells us that uh, through our good deeds, God accepts us and even owes us. That we are good people and by being good people, we put God in debt to us. And out of this mindset develops self-righteousness. Where you start to compare yourself to others. You go, well, I mean, I'm certainly better than them. Certainly nicer than they are. And a self-righteousness will eventually lead to bitterness when God doesn't do what you think you deserve. And so maybe you're here and things were fine. You were living holy, committed to God, because you grew up in a good family. But then mom got that diagnosis, and you prayed for healing, and it didn't come. And then she passed away, and it was a mess, and your family fell apart, and you have struggled and been frustrated, and there's a bitterness that crept into your heart towards God, and now here you are all these years later, still bitter. Still bitter because of that divorce. Still bitter because you lost that job. Still bitter because things didn't work out as you thought you deserved for them to work out. How did that happen? How'd you get here? How to step with God? Now, it's important to understand a little bit of the context of this older brother's offense, okay? Stay with me. Because in those times, the older son got two-thirds of the father's inheritance, okay? And so the double portion. If you had two kids, that would be two-thirds. If you had more, then it would be a different percentage. But in this instance, because he has two sons, the older son gets two-thirds, the younger son gets one-third, okay? So try to imagine this with me, a little math, all right? So the younger son cashes in early, which you're never supposed to do, but he does. And so he cashes in early, he gets one-third. The father sells the property, take a third of my inheritance, okay? So if there was $100, which I think there was more, he says, take 33, go, get out. You've done what you want to do. I'm allowing you to do this, right? And so the younger son takes it, and he takes it with him, and so now there's only 66% left, which technically all now belongs to the older brother upon the death of the father. You following this? But now when the father received the younger son back, he receives him back, and since the father hasn't actually technically died, the 66% is technically 100% because it all still belongs to the father. So in receiving him back now, right, what just happened, the younger son just got another third of what was the older son. And so when the older son is furious, saying, hey, that's my fat and calf, that's my robe, technically sort of it was his and so he's furious because he's losing out this decision of the father to receive the younger son back is costing the older son and so his reaction is because at his core he was less concerned about his brother's state of affairs he was less concerned about his father and his love for his father he was more concerned about getting his and so interestingly enough the same heart that was in the younger son to get from the father but not be in relationship with the father now appears in a more subtle way in the older son. I just want my things from God. I don't want relationship with God. I want to receive his blessings, but I don't want to prioritize relationship. I want transactional dynamics between us, not intimate communion between us. And so the result of both is a state of lostness, either emptiness or bitterness. I wonder if you can see a glimmer 
of the older son and the younger son in your own heart. Because Jesus tells this story to show us the condition of fallen humanity. That there's something in you that's going to try to get from God rather than get God himself. There's something in you that's going to want to control rather than surrender. There's something in you that sees God as a means to an end rather than an end in himself. But the whole point of this story is that you can be changed. You can be changed. That God can actually change the very inner condition of our hearts. That he can transform us. That he can take that thing out of us that wants to control God and instead bring us to a place of glad surrender. There's a place that we can experience real communion and relationship with God. But the way to get there is what we could call today a revelation of the Father. That in order to be changed, you must see God as he truly is. You must see him through the revelation of a father. Now, your father has had a big impact in your life. So has mine. Every one of us, we've been shaped by our dads. Whether you were close to your dad or whether you didn't have a great relationship, just take a second, even as I'm saying this, and reflect upon your relationship with your father. It's impacted you. It's impacted you in a very significant way. Psychologists tell us that it's, it's difficult to even quantify the impact of a father. Maybe you knew him really well. Maybe you never knew him. Maybe you're very close to this day. Maybe he passed away. Maybe he abandoned you as a kid. Maybe he was active. Maybe he was involved but never really led your family. Maybe he led but he was far too harsh. Whatever your story might be, your father has impacted you significantly. Studies have found that 90% of all homeless or runaway children came from fatherless home. Kids without a father are five times more likely to commit suicide, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to show behavioral disorders. Years ago, there was an interesting study that came out about a prison system where a greeting card company offered to give Mother's Day cards to all the inmates. And it was a huge hit. All the inmates participated. They all sent out Mother's Day cards on Mother's Day on behalf of this greeting card company. They paid for it all. And the greeting card company was so excited about the success of this that they said, hey, this is great. Let's do the same thing on Father's Day. And so they went to these prison inmates and they gave them Father's Day cards to send out to their dads on Father's Day, just like they did on Mother's Day, but not a single inmate participated in the Father's Day card celebration. See, for a lot of us, your dad is the place of your deepest wound, that he wasn't something you needed, that he wasn't what you hoped for. Maybe he was... Loving, maybe he was harsh, maybe he was distant, maybe he was close. Regardless, the shadow of your father looms large over your life. Because there's something inside of you that knows that no matter who he was or wasn't or is or isn't, it's not enough. And this is the central message of Jesus. That you can personally experience God moment by moment, day by day, second by second as father. That you can personally experience God this way. And it was always intended for you to do that. That even though you might have a concept of God in your mind that's distorted, God can untangle that concept and reveal himself to your heart as your father. And when you do that, you find the very meaning of life, the very essence of living. And so he calls you to this revelation of God as Father. Now, you have to understand that for a lot of Christians, the idea of God as Father is kind of a normal idea because we've been hearing it for 2,000 years. Pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. But for the people of Jesus' time, this was a scandalous idea. In fact, it's one of the reasons that they wanted to kill Jesus because he had the audacity to call God his Father. In fact, one scholar found the entire history of Judaism, from the earliest of writings to the 10th century AD, there's not a single reference of a Jewish person addressing God directly in the first person as father and so Jesus came with this revelation to show us that there is a God who might feel distant and far away but he is a God who is actually present and his desire is to have relationship with you his desire is to not have some transactional agreement but a dynamic relationship that this is why you were made this is the center of your life but you must realize that life's not about just getting God's things life is about getting God because the greatest gift God could ever give you is himself and when you know him and when you experience him for who he is you find the fullness of life and so this story is supposed to show us how God's different than we expect how God is not quite the father we expect him to be but we must understand him for who he is if we're ever going to know him truly 
So I want to make a few observations about the Father described in this text because it's a revelation of the heart of God. Observation one, God doesn't treat all his kids the same. He doesn't treat all, do you know that? He doesn't treat all his kids the same. Did you notice how he gave the younger son a party? And he didn't even give the older son a goat. Like, I mean, in those days, like, you know, you would think that they would do similar to what we do today, right? Where it's like, it's Johnny's birthday, but we bought Jill a present too so she doesn't freak out, you know? It's like we could have been like, well, let's celebrate for the one who came back and a little for you, son. You know, like, no. He's like, you didn't even give me a young goat. And we would expect the daddy to be like, all right, son, just take a goat. It's all good. But instead he's just like, I love you. He's like, well, what about the goat? I love you. Like, well, you didn't treat me the same. I'm not suggesting that God shows partiality. I'm not suggesting that he plays favorites. Something deeper. Something deeper we got to grasp. The story is teaching us that God, through your life, is writing a unique story. That it is unlike any other story he has ever written. And that he is going to provide what you need most for the story he's writing through you. And if you begin to compare that story to someone else's, you're going to miss the very purpose of your life. But your life can't be understood through the context of someone else's story. It must only be understood through the context of the unique story God is writing through you. See, God knows what you need more than your heart even knows what you need. See, what was the great barrier between the younger son and the father? The great barrier between the younger son and the father was shame. He was so ashamed. He already knew that he was unworthy, that he was unqualified, that he could not even be a son because of his sinful activity. And so in order to conquer that shame and remove the barrier between father and son, he lavishes his younger son with blessings and gifts so that the blessings would be so uncomfortable that the shame would be silenced. You see that? Wow, that's powerful. But then at the same time, the problem with the older brother was not shame. It was pride. He was so proud. And so rather than lavishing him with gifts, he, he just comes out to the porch and he tells him, I love you. I love you. You should care about your younger brother. Why don't you come inside? He doesn't lavish him with gifts. He just gives him space to process so that he can get through his pride. See, you see the wisdom of the father giving his sons different things depending upon what their hearts need most in order for relationship to be restored. See, he loves you enough to give you what you sometimes don't even pray for. He shepherds you and guides you on your own journey. I love the story of Peter after Jesus is risen from the dead. He's talking with Jesus, if you know the story, at the end of the Gospel of John. And Jesus tells him, Pete, listen, you are going to die for your faith. And you know what Peter's first words were to Jesus? What about John? Literally, that's the first thing he says. And, 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 and Jesus' response should be tattooed on our arms, all right? He says, back to, he says back to Peter, he says, what is that to you? I love that. What is that to you? You, follow me. Why are you so caught up in John's life? Why are you so concerned about John's marriage and John's blessings and John's car and John's career? Why are you living your life through the lens of Instagram, John, when you should be living your life through the call of God for you? Could it be? that you are missing the call because you've been so consumed with a comparison. Could it be that you've been holding God to somebody else's standard and somebody else's story when you won't know him until you know him as a father who does not treat all his kids the same? But even in the midst of that, he wants to reveal his deep love for you. I love the story in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis of Shasta. If you've seen the movies, the Chronicles of Narnia, they didn't make a movie about this one. I wish they had. It was my favorite one of all the stories, but they skipped it. It wasn't as cool, I guess. But, but Shasta is this character in one of the Chronicles of Narnia who has a really hard life. He's a fatherless kid. He goes through all these trials, all these struggles, all these problems. Towards the end of the book, Shasta's all by himself walking through the woods, and it's pitch black at night, and up walks Aslan. He's never met Aslan. Aslan's a big lion, and he represents Christ in all the stories. And up walks Aslan, and Shasta's there, and he's terrified because he hears and feels and sees something, but he can't really discern what it is in the middle of the darkness. And he says this. He says, who are you? He said it barely in a whisper. One who has waited long for you to speak, said the thing, because he doesn't know what it is. The voice was not loud, but it was very large and deep. Are you a giant, asked Shasta? You might call me a giant, said the large voice, but I'm not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all, said Shasta. Oh, please, please go away. What harm have I done to you? I'm the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more, Shasta felt the warm breath of this thing on his hand and his face. There, it said, that's not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. 
Shasta was a little reassured by the breath, so he told how he had never known his real father, how he'd been brought up sternly by the fishermen. He told of his escape and how he had chased lions and forced to swim for their lives and the dangers in Tashpen about the night and the tombs and the beasts that had howled in the desert. He told about the heat and the thirst and the desert journey, how they had almost gotten to their goal when another lion chased them and wounded his friend Erebus. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Don't you think it was bad luck for me to meet so many lions, asked Shasta? There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I just told you there were at least two lions the first night, and there was only one lion, but he's, he was swift of foot, said the voice. How do you know, asked Shasta. I was the lion. Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing. The voice continued. I was the lion that forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion, check this out, who drove you, who drove the jackals from you as you slept. I was the lion who gave your horses new strength of fear in the last mile so that you could reach King Loon in time. I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat which you lay, a child near death, so that it came to the shore where a man sat wakeful at midnight to receive you. Then it was you who wounded Erebus, asked Shasta. It was, but what for? Child, said the voice. Favorite part. I'm telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. Who are you? Asked Shasta. Maybe that's an appropriate question for you today. Maybe you've made some assumptions about God that are not true. Maybe you've seen him more like a boss than a father. Maybe you've seen him more like a judge than a father. Maybe you've seen him like a distant monarch than a father. Who are you really? Who, who, who are you? Maybe I should rethink my perception of God. Maybe I should rethink the assumptions I've made about God because what you will discover is that even in the sorrows, even in the struggles, even in the trials, he was working and moving and leading and guiding and somehow he didn't cause the problem, but he redeemed the problem. He didn't cause the pain, but he redeemed the pain. Somehow God was at work in ways that you can't even begin to comprehend and conceive, always leading you into his heart, always using opportunities to guide you to himself. He does not treat all his kids the same, but he is working in in your life right now. And if you could just see him by the spirit of Jesus today, if you could just begin to see that he's been working, it's not a coincidence that you're here. It's not a coincidence that you're hearing me say this. It's not a coincidence that God has aligned circumstances for you to be in this moment and maybe to see in yourself a little bit of that younger son or to see in yourself a little bit of that older son or to see in yourself that you've lost a vision of God as father and it's the root problem behind all your anxiety and all your fears. And if you could just experience him today you could be changed you could be changed see that's what we need an encounter with him and that's the second thing the second thing we see in this father is that we are transformed by the father's initiating love that it's the father who initiated in both instances it's the father who reaches out the father runs to the younger son now middle eastern patriarchs were not supposed to run ever 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 and yet he's running to his son. That was a shameful act in those days, but he does it. It's so uncomfortable how kind he is. He's kissing, they're dancing. He is way too kind, way too generous, disarms the younger son through his initiating love. And then he also initiates with the older son. He's out on the deck pleading with him, saying, come in, come in, get over yourself. Get over yourself and celebrate the healing of your brother. See beyond yourself, see beyond your comparisons and your pride. In both instances, the father goes way beyond what's expected. And I want to suggest today that that's the interpretive key of this whole story. That if you really want to understand it, in a sense, sure, it's about two sons. But even more, it's about the heart of the father. And we see God as father through this story going far beyond what's expected. And that helps us understand the real heartbeat behind this story. Because this story is told in context with two other stories, okay? The first one in John 15, verse 1, tells us about a shepherd, you may be familiar, who leaves the 99 sheep to find the one that's lost, right? And then he tells the story of a woman who has 10 coins, who lost one, and goes out and she sweeps her whole house to find the one lost coin. And so she celebrates, and the shepherd celebrates because they both find. But then they have this third story where there's two sons, but nobody goes out to find the third son, right? Or the, 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 the younger son. Nobody goes out to find him in the third story. And so there's an absence here. So the first one, it's the shepherd that goes out to find the sheep. And the second one, it's the woman who goes out to find the coin. And the third one, no one goes out. And that absence is intentional. It's intended to invite the listener to ask an obvious question. Uh, who should have gone out to rescue the son? Why didn't anybody go? And who, who, whose job was it to go? Well, in the culture of that day, everybody knew whose job it was. 
It was the job of the older brother. The older brother, on behalf of the father, should have gone out to rescue the younger son. But this older brother wasn't willing because he was all wrapped up in his own pride and in his religiosity. And so Jesus tells the story to highlight the fact that no one went out to rescue the younger son so that through that gap in the story, he could unveil who he truly is. That if the interpretive key of the whole story is that there's a father who goes beyond what's expected, then Jesus, through this story, is revealing to us that he is the representative of the father who goes far beyond what we would ever expect. That Jesus is, in fact, the better older brother who left his home in heaven in search of God's lost children. And that when he found you and I, he found us feeding pigs. He found us empty. He found us broken. But at his own expense, he brought us home. And he used his own inheritance to reinstate us. It personally cost him. And so when Jesus hung on the cross, he received the debt of my sin so that I could receive the debt of his righteousness. There could be a supernatural exchange where all of his goodness and all of his kindness and all of his mercy could be imputed to me and all of my sinfulness and all of my wickedness and all of my brokenness could be imputed to him. And so in that divine exchange, Christ took my sinfulness so that I could take his righteousness. And in doing so, he put me in a new position before God. So he enters into my brokenness so that I could enter into his wholeness. He enters into my rejection so that I could enter into his acceptance. He enters into my slavery so that I could enter into his sonship. And through this, God now sees me through the light of Christ in me rather than sin in me. That's why Galatians 4 can say now, now, oh my goodness, you are no longer, I wonder if you knew this about yourself, a slave. You are no longer a slave to your attachments. You are no longer a slave to your emptiness. You are no longer a slave to your pride, but you are God's own child and Since you're his child, God's made you his heir. Jesus shared his inheritance with you so that you could have eternal life. And it's this encounter with God's initiating love that changes us, where you start to realize there's a father who loves me. And if he loves me like this, then I shouldn't treat him like a transactional agreement. I should treat him like a dynamic relationship. I should treat him as not in pursuit of his things, but in pursuit of him. That my whole life should be built on not getting stuff, but knowing God. And in it, I find life. And the scripture says that in it, you find a new identity. Just as he changed Abram's name to Abraham and Simon's name to Peter and Jacob's name to Israel, so he's changed your name. Do you, do you know what name he gave you? Do you know the name that the Father speaks over us? And if you know that name, how it changes everything. It's the name that he spoke over Jesus at his baptism. Brennan Manning says it like this, define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is illusion. Thomas Merton said it like this, who am I? I am one loved by Christ. In coming home to the father, through the leadership of the older brother, I find the name beloved written over my life. And so this story is all about showing us the heart of God as father in order that we might follow him somewhere. Where? Home. In order that we might follow him home. See, the whole point of this story, you could even argue the whole point of life, is to convince your heart that you can trust God. That he's strong enough to keep you. That he's kind enough to love you. That every problem in your life, at its root, is a distorted image of God. That when you see him as he is, there's peace that surpasses understanding, joy unspeakable, full of glory, and hope for eternity, and love overflowing. That if you see him as he is, you can realize that to trust the Father is to find your way home. That to truly be at home with yourself, to truly be at home in life, to have peace, to have life, to have joy, to have hope, 
It all comes not from perfect circumstances, not when everything works out, when the job's just so, not when your marriage is perfectly right and everything's working great. That's not where you find peace. You find peace when you choose to trust the heart of the Father. And I just wonder if there's anybody here today who's gotten tangled up in older son thinking or younger son thinking, and you find yourself at a place where you're not at peace, where you're not at home, and the root of your issue is that you need to trust the heart of your father. You need to trust him again. You know, it's so interesting to me how this story ends. I read the whole story. Did you notice how it ends? It just ends. It's a cliffhanger. It is unresolved. Which just, that just caught my attention all week as I prayed for our church. Does the younger son ever get his act together? Does the older son ever come inside? Jesus does not resolve the story. And I believe there's a reason. I believe he does not resolve the story because he invites you to. That this is your story. And that you get to decide how it ends. That you get to decide whether or not the child comes home. That you get to decide whether or not you're going to trust that God really is what Christ revealed him to be. A good father. Would you stand with me? Take a moment, just close your eyes. And let's, let's just do some personal inventory. I feel that there's application here for the brand new person as well as there's application for those that have maybe been Christians for many years. And as we take this moment of introspection, I want to invite you to survey your own heart. And ask yourself if younger son thinking has slipped in where you're living your way and it's leading to emptiness. Ask yourself if older son thinking has slipped in where you've convinced yourself that God owes you but you don't know grace. And ask yourself maybe most importantly if you're living in dynamic communion with God as father. Or is it possible that somewhere along the line the relationship became transactional? And you lost his heart in the midst of all your pursuits. Do you pursue him for him? Do you desire him for him? Or are you just trying to get him to bless your plan? Put a stamp of approval on it and move to the side. I want to pray that God would just, by his grace, enable us to come to ourselves today. To see that there's a father who wants relationship. And that this is everything that we've been looking for. Let's pray. Spirit of Jesus, would you minister to us? Would you be the older brother that we need? And would you find us right where we are? Spirit of Jesus, would you locate us even now? And would you, even as we worship and sing, would you take us by the hand and lead us to the Father? God, for those who are hurting, I pray that you bring healing. For those who are cold, I pray that you soften us. For those that are tired, I pray that you bring strength. For those that are anxious, I pray that you bring peace. Spirit of Jesus, would you find us right now? And would you lead us back to the heart of a God who writes a unique story through each of our lives? Lord, as we worship today, as we sing, would you bring us home again? In Jesus' name.